across the planet, nations and cities are working to reduce their dependence on fossil fuels and promote sustainable energy options. Because it's the smart thing, because it makes business sense, and it's the right thing. In China, Europe, and Brazil, energy innovations are changing how we live. And in the U.S., every branch of the military is mobilizing to cut its carbon boot print. We really believe that the, uh, the climate is changing. In this program, we'll share how we know Earth is warming and why, and discover what Earth science tells us about clean, green energy opportunities. I'm Richard Alley. I'm a geologist at Penn State University, but my research has taken me round the planet, from Greenland to Antarctica. I'm fascinated by how our climate has changed dramatically and often from times with ice everywhere to no ice anywhere on the planet. Records of past climate help us learn how Earth operates. What has happened can happen again. And I know that sometimes things change really fast. I'm a registered Republican, play soccer on Saturdays, and go to church on Sundays. I'm a parent and a professor. I worry about jobs for my students and my daughter's future. I've been a proud member of the UN panel on climate change, and I know the risks. And I've worked for an oil company and know how much we all need energy. And the best science shows we'll be better off if we address the twin stories of climate change and energy, and that the sooner we move forward, the better. Our use of fossil fuels for energy is pushing us towards a climate unlike any seen in the history of civilization. But a growing population needs more and more clean energy. But I believe science offers us an operator's manual with answers to both of these huge challenges. Humans need energy. We always have and always will. But how we use energy is now critical for our survival. It all began with fire. Today, it's mostly fossil fuels. Now we're closing in on 7 billion of us, and the planet's population is headed toward 10 billion. Our cities and our civilization depend on vast amounts of energy. Fossil fuels, coal, oil, and natural gas, provide almost 80% of the energy used worldwide. Nuclear is a little less than 5%, hydropower a little under 6 and the other renewables, solar, wind, and geothermal, about 1%, but growing fast. Wood and dung make up the rest. Using energy is helping many of us live better than ever before. Yet well over a billion and a half are lagging behind without access to electricity or clean fuels. In recent years, Brazil has brought electricity to 10 million. But in rural Ceará, some still live off the grid. No electricity, no running water, and no refrigerators to keep food safe. Life's essentials come from their own hard labor. Education is compulsory, but studying's a challenge when evening arrives. The only light is from kerosene lamps. They're smoky, dim, and dangerous. Someday, this mother prays the electric grid will reach her home. The first thing I'll do when the electricity arrives in my house will be to say a rosary and give praise to God. More than half of China's 1.3 billion citizens live in the countryside. Many rural residents still use wood or coal for cooking and heating, although most of China is already on the grid. China has used energy to fuel the development that has brought more than half a billion out of poverty. In village homes, there are flat-screen TVs and air conditioners. 
By 2030, it's projected that 350 million Chinese, more than the population of the entire United States, will move from the countryside to cities, a trend that's echoed worldwide. Development in Asia, Africa, and South America will mean three billion people will start using more and more energy as they escape from poverty. Suppose we make the familiar, if old-fashioned, 100-watt light bulb our unit for comparing energy use. If you're off the grid, your share of your nation's energy will be just a few hundred watts, a few light bulbs. South Americans average about 13 bulbs. For fast developing China, it's more like 22 bulbs. Europe and Russia, 5,000 watts, 50 bulbs. And North Americans, over 10,000 watts, more than 100 bulbs. Now, let's replace those light bulbs with the actual numbers. Population shown across the bottom and energy use displayed vertically. Off the grid to the left, North America to the right. If everyone, everywhere, started using energy at the rate North Americans do, the world's energy consumption would more than quadruple. And using fossil fuels, that's clearly unsustainable. No doubt about it. Coal, gas, and oil have brought huge benefits. But we're burning through them approximately a million times faster than nature saved them for us, and they will run out. What's even worse, the carbon dioxide from our energy system threatens to change the planet in ways that'll make our lives much harder. So why are fossil fuels such a powerful but ultimately problematic source of energy? Conditions on the waterways of today's Louisiana help us understand how fossil fuels are made and why they're ultimately unsustainable. Oil, coal, and natural gas are made from things, mostly plants, that lived and died long ago. It's taken hundreds of millions of years for nature to create enough of the special conditions that save the carbon and energy in plants to form the fossil fuels that we use. Here's how it works. Plants, like these tiny diatoms encased in silica shells, grow in the upper layers of lakes and oceans, using the sun's energy to turn carbon dioxide and water into more plants. When they die, if they're buried where there's little oxygen to break them down, their chemical bonds retain the energy that began as sunlight. If enough carbon-rich matter is buried deeply enough for long enough, the Earth's heat and pressure turn it into fossil fuel, concentrating the energy that once fed the growing plants. Vary what goes into Earth's pressure cooker and the temperature, and you end up with the different kinds of fossil fuel. Woody plants make coal, slimy plants, algae, will give you oil, and both of them give rise to natural gas. The fossil fuels formed over a few hundred million years, and we're burning them over a few hundred years. And if we keep doing that, sooner or later, they must run out. But there's a bigger problem with fossil fuels. As we've seen, they're made of carbon primarily. When you burn them, add oxygen, and that makes CO2 that goes in the air. We're reversing the process by which they formed. And if we keep doing this, it must change the composition of Earth's atmosphere. What CO2 does was confirmed by basic research that had absolutely nothing to do with climate change. A continuance of the upper air program will provide scientific data concerning the physics of the upper atmosphere. World War II was over, but the Cold War had begun. The U.S. Air Force needed to understand the atmosphere for communications and to design heat-seeking missiles. At certain wavelengths, carbon dioxide and water vapor block radiation. So the new missiles couldn't see very far if they used a wavelength that CO2 absorbs. 
research at the Air Force Geophysics Laboratory in Hanscom, Massachusetts, produced an immense database with careful measurements of atmospheric gases. Further research by others applied and extended those discoveries, clearly showing the heat-trapping influence of CO2. The Air Force hadn't set out to study global warming, they just wanted their missiles to work. But physics is physics. The atmosphere doesn't care if you're studying it for warring or warming. Adding CO2 turns up the planet's thermostat. It works the other way as well. Remove CO2 and things cool down. These are the Southern Alps of New Zealand and their climate history shows that the physicists really got it right. These deep, thick piles of frozen water are glaciers, slow-moving rivers of ice sitting on land. But once, when temperatures were warmer, they were liquid water stored in the sea. We're going to follow this one, the Franz Josef, from summit to ocean to see the real-world impact of changing levels of CO2. It's beautiful up here on the highest snow field, but dangers lurk beneath the surface. I've spent a lot of time on the ice. It's standard practice up here to travel in pairs, roped up for safety. The glacier is fed by something like six meters of water a year, maybe 20 meters, 60 feet of snowfall, so a really seriously high snowfall. The snow and ice spread under their own weight and it's headed downhill at something like a kilometer a year. When ice is speeding up a lot as it flows towards the coast, it can crack and open great crevasses that give you a, a view into the guts of the glacier. Man, this is a big one. 20, 30 meters, more, 100 feet or more heading down in here, and we can see a whole lot of the structure of the glacier right here. So what we're gonna do is just go sit on the edge and then walk back towards Mount Lauria. Tell me when. Okay, roll it around, and down we go. Snowfall arrives in layers, each storm putting one down. Summer sun heats the snow and makes it look a little bit different than the winter snow. And so you build up a, a history. In these layers, there's indications of climate, how much it snowed, what the temperature was. And all of this is being buried by more snow. And the weight of that snow squeezes what's beneath it and turns it to ice. And in doing that, it can trap bubbles. And in those bubbles are samples of old air, a record of the composition of the Earth's atmosphere, including how much CO2 was in it, a record of the temperature on the ice sheets, and how much it snowed. Nice and slowly. Okay. So I'll pull As we'll this. see, we can open those icy bottles of ancient air and study the history of Earth's atmosphere. This landscape also tells the story of the ice ages and the forces that have shaped Earth's climate. Over the last millions of years, the brightness of the sun doesn't seem to have changed much. But the Earth's orbit and the tilt of its axis have shifted in regular patterns over tens and hundreds of thousands of years. The orbit changes shape, varying how close and far the Earth gets as it orbits the Sun each year. Over 41,000 years, the tilt of Earth's axis gets larger and smaller, shifting some of the sunshine from the equator to the poles and back. And our planet has a slight wobble, like a child's top, altering which hemisphere is most directly pointed toward the Sun when Earth is closest to it. Over tens of thousands of years, these natural variations shift sunlight around on the planet, and that influences climate. More than 20,000 years ago, decreasing amounts of sunshine in the Arctic allowed great ice sheets to grow across North America and Eurasia, reaching the modern sites of New York and Chicago. Sea level fell as water was locked up on land, 